know you're out there. I know you're beautiful. Thank you for being here. So today's event we're super excited for. So, but first a few uh, library announcements I have for you. Uh, my name's Anissa. I am a community program engagement coordinator. So booking programs for all of you. And I will put my um, email in the chat box. I also already put a link to today's document, which I'll be taking uh, notes as the presentation goes along. And that resource will be sent to you later on. But the link is live as well. So you can pick up that link as we go. But I'll be doing some editing later to it and send it out later. Uh, let's see. Welcome to our virtual library. Uh, we want to uh, welcome to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal folks and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribes as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we work and reside here in the Bay Area. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the painful situation our country is in and um, acknowledge that the library is not a neutral institution and that we stand behind Black Lives Matter as well as trying to constructively end systemic racism and um, work towards a, a better future and be better people. We do this at the library, all of this great work by providing factual and useful information. That's what we do. And so in this document, you'll also get a giant list of great resources on Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, the Black Panther Party, but also lots of resources on Black joy, Black art, Black fiction, queer Black art, all sorts of great things and some great resources on indigenous culture and indigenous resources, including links to um, one of my favorite is a map that's interactive and you can uh, put your coordinates in and it'll tell you what tribal groups already live there. And if there were also any treaties in place and what treaties were broken. It's a pretty amazing um, map. So let's see. Some other announcements, pardon me. We have lots of events coming up. Um, August, we celebrate our On the Same Page. We have a different author. It, it's every month or every bi-monthly. We've kind of done some weird things since we went into um, quarantine. So right now we're doing it every month. August will be fe featuring author and local San Franciscan Virgie Tovar and Virgie will be speaking on August 18th and we'll have a book club focusing on her book you have the right to remain fat very excited um, some other great events I definitely encourage you to, to sign up for our newsletter uh, we have all these posted and these will be in the docs we have our first social justice book club. Well, it's probably not the first in San Francisco Public Library's history, but in recent times, and we'll be reading Citizen. I encourage you to come for that. We partnered with National Park Service in Alcatraz to bring you several programs throughout summer. Um, we've already had two of them, which both were amazing. So coming up, we have Ingenuity. We also have the Women of Red Power who um, you know, help lead the forces of the occupation on Alcatraz. Some other great events, and I'm kind of going to just gloss over these because these will be in the document. Um, suffrage. This is a big one. We have our eighth Poet Laureate nominations open for a few more days. So if you know a San Francisco poet who's been published, please nominate them. We would love to have them in our mix and in our hat to see what will happen for our next eighth Poet Laureate. We're really excited about this. Um, something I am other, another project I've become super uh, passionate about, and this is the census. So if you have not taken your census, tell everybody to tell everybody to take your census. Did you know California has not lost a House of Representatives seat since 1850? And if we don't participate as a whole, we are in the threat of losing that seat. And we don't want to do that. Also, each count brings in $20,000 to San Francisco for community services, senior services, homeless services, food services. Every single person counts regardless of any status you have. 
please do not fear the census. And if you ever have any questions on this, like I said, it's, it's become a project I've been super passionate about. Uh, you can email me if you need any assistance. They've got a phone line. They've got like 20 different languages. It's amazing. So please do not let this one slide away or you'll be getting a knock on the door from the census people. So that's the other reason to, to get your census taken. All right, and I think I have run through all of my notes perfectly, 10 minutes, I did it. And once again, I wanna thank everybody here for joining us, 140 people, that is amazing. Thank you, I'm clapping for you all. Um, today we have the Yerba Buena chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I also wanna remind you, oh, this is super reminder before we jump in. Wear your masks, keep doing it, keep doing it. Um, you know, it's not just to protect you, it's to protect everybody else as well. And then, you know, we got free COVID testing in our city. So please go take advantage of that. It's pretty easy. I hear the line is now a little bit longer than it has been, but you drive through, stick your nose out and you're done. I got my test in one day. Zoom questions. If you please put your questions in the Q&A, function of Zoom and we'll get to them that way. Um, chat, you can chat away. I'll put links in as we go in the chat box. And I think that's it now. Oh yes, these guys, special thanks to our friends of the San Francisco Public Library who sponsors such great events and sponsor what we do in our mission. If you're not a friends member, I encourage you to become one. All right, now it is time for I will stop sharing my screen and allow Susan to take over the screen. Uh, today we have the Yerba Buena chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And today Susan Karasoff is going to talk about edible and native fruits and vegetables of San Francisco and the ethnobotany behind that. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. And I am now going to shut down and mute myself. And I'm here in the background to help you. Susan, it's all yours. Everybody welcome Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Karasoff from the California Native Plant Society. Native Plant Society. Wonderful. We see you. We're ready. Great. I'm Susan Karasoff from the California Native Plant Society. Bob Hall from the California Native Plant Society is monitoring our Zoom Q&A and Anissa is going to monitor the YouTube chat. And I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, answer questions for about 20 minutes, and we are going to explore the delicious intersection of edible plants that are also local native plants. What are native plants? Native plants are plants that evolved here in San Francisco in our varied geology with our varied weather and co-evolved with our local butterflies, birds, bees, and wildlife. So San Francisco has soil underneath all that concrete and we had a bunch of things evolve here. These native plants evolved with our local wildlife and are the basis of our food web. So if we plant, for instance, that local violet, where humans can eat those delicious leaves. Not only can we eat those leaves, but that beautiful butterfly's caterpillar, it's, it's baby phase, needs to eat those leaves and can only eat those leaves. So we only get that beautiful butterfly if that caterpillar has its baby food, that violet as a larval plant. And it's gotta be our local violet. It can't be another kind of violet. So, when you see chewed leaves on your plants, please celebrate that you are feeding your ecosystem as well as feeding yourself and your family. So why eat edible plants that evolved in San Francisco? Because you get to taste the flavors that are unique to our ecosystem. And because some of them are flavors you have never tasted before. And for us foodies, new flavors are our favorite adventure. So this discussion is in four parts. We're gonna talk about edible plants for pots, edible plants for clay, edible plants for sandy, fast draining soil, and best practices to garden successfully in San Francisco. 
we're going to talk about a bunch of food types. So for all of these plants, there's gonna be a little icon, uh, a leaf, if the leaf is edible, that little seed or nut icon, if it's seed or nuts are edible, uh, the bulb and root icon, if the bulb or root are edible, is edible, the flower icon, because we have a bunch of edible flowers that are delicious, and fruit. So let's start with pots. A lot of us garden in pots on our balconies or in window boxes, and plants that work well in pots have short root systems like annuals or our bulbs. Annuals are plants that live their entire life cycle in one year, including producing seed for the next year so they live fast and die young. Annuals don't waste a lot of energy building a root system, so their short root systems thrive in our pots. And bulbs have their underground growth in a shallow space, so they also thrive in pots. Miner's lettuce is our native lettuce, and it is the easiest plant to grow in San Francisco. To grow miner's lettuce, buy the seed, and after the first rain, after November 1st, spread the seed on any soil in a pot or on the ground, and watch the little green shoots come up and get a little taller every time it rains. And the green shoots pause growing when it's dry and wait for more rain, even for months. You cannot over or underwater miner's lettuce. It responds to any kind of care. Just get the seeds out of a packet and onto some sort of soil and exposed to some rain or some occasional hand watering. Miner's lettuce loves shade and north facing patios. It will live in sun, but it will wither more quickly in sun than in shade. So eat it when the leaves look nice and round like that picture. It takes about eight inches of rain and or hand watering to get miner's lettuce to finish growing. So let some of the tiny white flowers produce seed for next year and you'll always have a lovely crop of miner's lettuce in late winter. After a few years of letting your miner's lettuce go to seed, then you will have a lovely winter season ground cover in addition to a bountiful source of winter salad greens. The leaves, the seeds, the flowers are all edible and the leaves are delicious raw as salad greens. Our famous California poppies are easy to grow annuals with delicious toasty flavored seeds. California poppy seeds can be substituted in any recipe where you would use store-bought poppy seeds, so baked goods and salad dressings. So let some of the flowers produce seed to get more poppies the following year. California poppies prefer some sun and any soil and they are completely drought tolerant. Chia sage, that beautiful blue flower, is one of the two different sages that produce the chia seed that you can use in drinks and puddings. The other chia seed source is the Mexican sage, Salvia Hispanica. Chia sage is an annual with edible leaves, bright blue edible flowers, and those famous chia seeds. Red maids is an annual with edible leaves and dark pink flowers. This annual prefers sandy, fast draining soil, even in a pot. So when you choose your pot soil, be aware that, be aware that red maids will only grow if you select sandy soil. If your pots are on a roof, Sandy soil is the lightest weight soil, so it's likely the soil you would choose for your roof garden. So these are only a few examples of the edible California annuals for pots. Larner's Seeds website has more information on which California annuals produce edible seeds, as well as selling those seeds. And I'll refer to Larner's, Larner's Seeds again um, in the best practices section. They're a wonderful source for edible, edible California annual seeds. So next let's talk about bulbs. So all three of these plants have, um, grow from bulbs and so they're great in pots. There are 70 California onion species. They are all entirely edible. So they all grow beautifully in pots. The pink flowers in the center belong to one of our local species. Um, San Francisco has two onion, onion species that are local. So just like the European and Asian allium relatives that you eat now, so onions, garlic, shallots, leeks, and chives, each of the California onions has its own flavor and will be distinctive in different dishes. So um, because it's entirely edible and the, the leaves are edible, the bulb is edible, 
the seeds are edible and the flowers are edible. The onion seeds have a slight oniony flavor, so they work well as toppings for avocado toast or French buckwheat crepes. And the mild onion flavored flowers can be used in cocktails like Gibson's and martinis. So remember that if you eat the bulb, you do not get flowers, leaves, and seeds to eat the next year. So perhaps buy a few of them. If you're going to eat a bulb, eat one or two. Let the rest of the bulbs uh, expand so that you have a nice source of onions for the next year. All onion species thrive in full sun in any soil. On the left is elegant Brodiaea. It has edible flowers and bulbs. The gorgeous purple flowers are edible raw and they taste like lettuce. Its flower is slightly less sweet than the orthorial sphere on the right, the purple flower on the right. Brodiaea's bulb does need to be cooked to be edible and it thrives in slow and medium draining soil like clay and it can thrive in some shade. It, the Brodiaea blooms a couple of weeks after their ethereal spear. So if you plant both, you can continue to have beautiful flowers in your garden as well as your salad. So ethereal spear on the right is similar to Brodiaea. It's got edible flowers and edible bulbs. And the bulbs have to be cooked to be edible. And I haven't tasted the bulb yet because I really like eating the flowers. They're a little bit more cup shaped, so they can not only be eaten raw in salad, but you can cook them instead of squash blossoms for stuffed appetizers and pasta sauce or in quesadillas. It also thrives in slow and medium draining soil and can thrive in some shade. So ethereal spear and elegant brodier have similar planting needs. So let's talk, trend, uh, let's talk specifically about edible plants for clay now and slow draining soil. And some of these plants will also thrive in sandy soil and I'll mention that. We'll start with ground covers. Why have grass when you can plant an edible ground cover? San Francisco was called yerba buena by the Spanish. Yerba buena means good herb. The yerba buena plant has delicious leaves that taste like a combination of oregano and a mild mint. It's delicious brewed as a tea um, or used raw or cooked in recipes. I personally crumble raw yerba buena on top of plain yogurt for stewed Afghani kadu or squash. So yerba buena thrives in shade, fog, and fog drip, and it thrives across San Francisco and all of our soil types, including sandy soil as well as slow draining soil. And it's a lovely evergreen ground cover. Woodland strawberry has edible fruit and tastes like a small seedy supermarket strawberry. It grows better in sort of a semi-shade, slow draining soil. And it's a lovely evergreen ground cover with showy white flowers in the spring. There is a local beach strawberry that grows well in semi-shady, fast draining sandy soil. And we'll talk about that in the sand section. Western wild ginger has delicious spicy sweet roots and dark red flowers. These ginger roots are delicious raw, brewed as a tea, or cooked in recipes like carrot cupcakes and lentil soup. In the wild, this ginger lives underneath other plants near creeks and streams as an understory plant. So it likes deep, deep shade, as dark as possible, plus consistently damp areas. If you plant this ginger where it does not get daily water, then you will need to hand water it. San Francisco has underground streams. So if your garden is on top of one of those streams, then this is the perfect place to plant ginger. And Western wild ginger is a lovely dark evergreen ground cover. So California has 39 violet species and San Francisco is home to two of those violets, the yellow one and the purple one. I grow them both and the leaves taste the same to me. So the leaves are the same leaves that feed that caterpillar that turn into that gorgeous butterfly earlier. So just keep in mind, these are really good for your ecosystem as well as delicious for you. The violet leaves persist a little bit longer than the miner's lettuce does. So it gives you another opportunity to continue having salad after miner's lettuce has gone to seed. This is a shade loving understory summer uh, undercover ground cover. Um, it's summer deciduous, which means that when it stops raining or you stop watering it, it's going to go dormant and the leaves will die back. 
but the roots will still be alive underground and violets will leaf out and flower again after the rains start. So these are some of our delicious, delicious shrubs that provide uh, food for us here in the clay soil continuum. Monkey flower savory is an herb with strongly flavored minty leaves and tubular minty flavored flowers. I, uh, whoops. This understory plant likes shade and damp areas. The leaves can be brewed as tea or used raw anywhere you use mint. Both the flowers and the leaves can be used raw in a watermelon salad. So California has 89 sage species. And our local sage in San Francisco is the hummingbird sage with edible leaves, flowers, and seeds. Those hot pink flowers taste like fruit punch, so they would be delicious on top of a crisp Moroccan carrot salad. Every California native salvia has edible leaves, flowers, and seeds, each species with a different flavored leaf and flower. And the leaves are all delicious cooked where you would use supermarket sage in a pasta sauce. Most of the other California native salvia have spicy flavored flowers that would be a delicious addition to salsas or on quesadillas. Be sure to choose a sage with the Latin name that starts with salvia. Some common plants, um, common plant names have sage in them, but they're, they're not actual sages. True sages start with salvia in that, in that two word name. So this is salvia spathica. Almost all salvias need sun all day long. Hummingbird sage is the only California native salvia that can live in some shade. It needs a tiny bit of sun to flower, but it can, it can live in a lot of sage, in, in a lot of shade. And hummingbirds love hummingbird sage. Other California native salvia species that do well in San Francisco include Leucophilia, Mellifera, Brandisi, and Pozo Blue. There are flat salvias, um, Sonoma, Gracias, and Point Sal that are lovely ground covers for sunny areas. So when you shop for a sage plant, taste a little bit of the leaf to choose which sage leaf flavor you like best. And different native sages are adapted to California's varied soils. So check your soil type when you shop for sages and restrict your tasting to the leaves from the sages that will thrive in your soil type. Thimbleberry is in the raspberry family and it has delicious berries. Berries in the raspberry family have a wide variety of flavors and include blackberries, boysenberries, and salmon berries. Thimbleberry's fruit is delicious and tastes like no berry that you have ever tasted. Thimbleberries are soft, so eat them right off the bush or make them into jam or ice cream. The red berries are ripe for only one day. They're beige the day before and they're um, dry the day after. If these berries had a longer shelf life, you would see them at the farmer's market, um, also if they were a little firmer. If you think you can't grow anything, try thimbleberry. I've grown it in damp shade, dry shade, damp sun and dry sun, and it thrives in all of them. It does spread readily, so don't bother buying more than one plant. It will make itself at home. It, it's going to like a lot of room. So um, it does also thrive in, sa in sand. I've seen it in Golden Gate Park in their sandy areas and it's doing just beautifully there. So if you, want it, if you want to eat your thimbleberry, hang out in your garden at the end of June and uh, get some of those delicious berries before the birds get them. So salmonberry is also in the raspberry family. Like thimbleberry with its own unique flavor like no berry you have ever tasted. Salmon berries can top cereal or be cooked on tarts because salmon berries is a bit firmer than thimbleberry. This tall, deciduous, thorny bush, this does have thorns, has showy hot pink flowers and thrives in shade. Although it does not fruit unless the leaves get a tiny bit of sun, I have experimented and discovered that to be true. <laughs> I planted mine in deep shade and they flowered, they just didn't fruit. You do need two salmonberry bushes to cross pollinate to get fruit, but they'll flower without, without a friend there. Pink flowering currant on the right is a relative of the European black currant cassis. 
The berries have a sweet tart flavor and are delicious raw and can, can top savory dishes such as parsnip puree or roasted butternut squash. This shrub has a long blooming late winter, early spring pink flowers. So it's a gorgeous addition to a year round flower garden. And this deciduous shade loving shrub thrives in both clay and sandy soil. So those are our three deciduous edible shrubs. So that deciduous means they lo lose their leaves. These are our evergreen shrubs. So huckleberries are a blueberry relative that tastes more delicious and more complex than blueberries. It tastes as if an East Coast blueberry went on a five hour wine, wine tasting tour in Sonoma and then you ate it. So it's an evergreen understory plant. It likes a lot of shade. It does like damp areas and it grows slowly. California Native Plant Society rarely recommends a garden selection, but Blue Madonna Huckleberry selection of, of this vaccinium bovatum flowers and fruits heavily from the first year, even when it's a little one gallon plant. So it's worth it every penny to get more fruit. And huckleberries can be used instead of blueberries in any recipe. Coast Barberry has tart berries with pectin to firm up pie fillings. Coast barberries in, this, barberries in the same family as Zareshk, the famous Persian berry that's used dried in Persian savory rice dishes, such as Zareshk polo. This tall, narrow, evergreen bush has bright yellow flowers in the late winter and early spring, thriving in shade and sun and any soil. So it makes a lovely evergreen hedge. So those are our two evergreen edible shrubs. Here are our trees. So the California hazelnut tree has delicious nuts with the hazelnut flavor and crunch that you already know. If you get your hazelnuts from Trader Joe's, then you have likely tasted a California hazelnut hybrid. Oregon, where Trader Joe's sources their hazelnuts, has two kinds of na native hazelnut trees, one of which is this California hazelnut, in addition to growing the European hazelnut trees. This 18 foot tall tree is a um, deciduous tree or shrub is easy to grow. It thrives in shade or part shade and in slow draining or fast draining soil. You do need two plants as well as some water to produce nuts, but it's going to grow just fine and be drought tolerant if you don't have a lot of water for it. The blue elderberry on the right, that tree has delicious fruit that can be eaten raw or made into sauces for pancakes and ice cream. Elderberry syrups are used in Europe and Asia as well as the United States for cough remedies such as umka. This 30 foot tall deciduous tree or shrub is easy to grow. And it thrives in shade and sun and any soil. So it's a wonderful garden plant to use across San Francisco. So the next section is about sandy soil edible plants. So I haven't tasted these plants because I can't grow them, I have clay soil. But for those of you who are on the part of the city that has sandy soil, these are plants for you. The beach strawberry tastes like a CD supermarket strawberry because supermarket strawberries were bred using California's beach strawberry as grandparents. The beach strawberries are a lovely evergreen white flowered ground cover. Chaparral currant is a relative of the pink flowering currant, but chaparral currant only lives in sandy or rocky serpentine soils. This bright pink flowered deciduous shrub has a long winter and early spring bloom, so it's another great addition to a year-round flower garden. Chaparral currant does need some wind protection, so con consider adding a silk tassel bush, Garia elliptica, upwind, or a holly leaf cherry tree upwind to protect this currant if you're in a windy area. The holly leaf cherry tree has edible fruit. This 30 foot tall evergreen white flowered tree requires sandy fast draining soil. So it's gonna be great in the sunset and Richmond areas and it loves wind and fog. Osoberry has edible fruit. This 20 foot tall deciduous white flowered tree or shrub thrives in sandy soil and prefers shade. So let's talk about best practices to garden successful to garden successfully to grow edible native plants. 
We're going to talk about the soils of San Francisco, our weather, our rainy season. We're going to share some edible plant hand handouts that the California Native Plant Society made based on our local edible plants. We'll talk about ethnobotany, plant selection tools, sources for edible plants, tasting notes, avoiding poison, and avoiding invasive plants. So let's take another look at this picture. These are the soils of San Francisco. Um, we, have, we have plants that evolved in every one of those soil types. So our soils include sand and uh, serpentine soil and Franciscan rock and clay-like muddy fill. So because our plants evolved with those specific soils, it's important to know what kind of soil you have when you select your plants. And we have varied weather with three different fog and wind belts. Thank goodness the, the San Francisco Department of Environment put this chart together and it just explains so much about our weather. Some parts of San Francisco are foggier and windier than other parts. The eastern side of San Francisco is sunnier than the western side. Canyons between our hills can concentrate the wind such that the, the middle section of San Francisco can be very windy. So choose plants that evolved in your area and that will help you select plants that will grow successfully. And San Francisco has variable rainfall from month to month and year to year. The chart on the left shows that winter is the rainy season. The best time to install native plants is during the winter rainy season. If you came from the East Coast, then our dry summers, that stuff in the middle where it looks like there isn't any rain because there isn't any rain, that's the best time to decide what to plant. This is a lot like your snowy winters. There's the time when you decide what to plant and there's the time when you actually plant. So decide what to plant during the dry season, install those plants during the rainy season. The error bars in the chart on the right show how much variation San Francisco gets in rain from month to month over different years. Drought is a fact of life in California. So plan your garden around the lower end of San Francisco's expected average rainfall of 20 inches a year. And you will be able to be more successful in keeping your plants alive. The chart at the bottom shows the wide variation in San Francisco's total yearly rainfall from as much as 50 inches of rain a year when we get atmospheric rivers and as little as seven inches of rain a year when we have terrible drought. Expect that rainfall to that rainfall variation to continue while you garden and understand that irrigation is one of the first items to get cut when California is in drought and we are often in drought. So as you take your soil and weather into account when selecting your plants, the California Native Plant Society, your Buena chapter offers free edible plant handouts on our website. And that includes many of the plants that we discussed today. So this is a, an easy way to get a copy of what we've been talking about with some nice pictures, a few extra plants, including some I haven't grown. And uh, this way you don't have to have taken quite such good notes today. So CalScape is the California Native Plant Society's plant selection tool. And it can help when you're selecting your plant. It includes detailed plant descriptions, including size and photographs, soil and water needs, and the butterflies that it feeds. You're gonna to wanna to take the size of a plant into account. That, that blue elderberry wants to be 30 feet. That California hazelnut wants to be 18 feet. And some plants are better about being taken, cut back than others. Um, but when in doubt, choose something that's a, going to fit your space. It's going to be less maintenance for you. Calscape also has a list of nurseries, not only for plants, but also for seeds and bulbs. So it's a good resource for figuring out where to get all the delicious plants that we've been talking about today. For pots, these are specific seed and bulb sources. Larner seeds that we talked about earlier, Annie's Annuals is over in Richmond, California. So not the Richmond area of San Francisco, but across the Bay. They've got plants, bulbs, and seeds. The rest of these places are places where you can order plants and bulbs online. 
really great to be able to to get the things that we need and especially a, a wide variety when you go to some of these online sources. I use iNaturalist, which is a free citizen science program that's written and supported by the California Academy of Sciences to figure out where a specific edible plant grows in San Francisco so that I can decide whether or not it really might work for me. I use Calscape and iNaturalist and it's a good combination. iNaturalist can also help identify what wildlife uses that particular plant such as butterflies, birds, and bees. It's a wonderful tool and it's, it's free to use. Ethnobotany is the search term to find out what our local tribes, San Francisco's current and ancestral Ohlone and Coast Miwok tribes grew and how they used those plants for food and medicine. I determine a plant's edibility by checking that there are ethnobotanical resources to that plant to its edibility and to any processing required such as cooking or leaching that's required to make that plant edible. Daniel Mormon's book, Native American Ethnobotany, compiles more than 4,000 North American plants and their uses by indigenous tribes for food, medicine, tools, and domestic needs. The San Francisco Library has Daniel Mormon's book, Native American Food Plants, which is the edible plant subset of Native American ethnobotany. There's also a web interface to Daniel Mormon's plant database in addition to the books. So there are many introduced plants that grow well in San Francisco. Well-known introduced edible plants such as plums and lemons are addressed in Pam Pierce's book, Golden Gate Gardening, of which the San Francisco Library has multiple copies. So if you waited through this discussion to hear about tomatoes, this is the book you need. It's the best book about how to grow San Francisco's introduced edible plants. So tasting notes. So please make sure, 100% sure, that, the, that you know what a plant is before you eat any of it. And tasting a leaf from a labeled plant at a nursery is the safest way to make sure that you're eating the plant that you intend to eat. And please only collect 30 um, edible parts from the plants from your own garden and where you have permission and collect only 30% of any patch of plants so that some remains to feed wildlife and to, to regrow the next year. Be aware that many land managers apply poison to ground and to plants. So please don't eat edible plants in the wild. Um, wild plants thrive best when left alone. And please don't put poison where you're planting edible plants. So no insecticides, no herbicides, no rodenticides, no fungicides. It's, it's not safe, it's not worth it. Um, go ahead and let nature take care of your pest problems for you like that very cute ladybug chowing down on that, what is to at least her delicious aphid. And please avoid planting any invasive plants. There are some edible plants that grow in California that are invasive. Himalayan blackberry, fennel, red valerian, nasturtiums, they're all invasive. Please, please don't plant them. There's more information about, edible, uh, about invasive plants at California's Invasive Plant Council website. So there are more discussions in this native plant series for the San Francisco Library. These include planting for butterflies and pollinators on Saturday, August 22nd, and shade gardening with California native plants on September 26th. Both of those will be at 1 p.m. So please let me know in the Q&A for Zoom or in the chat for YouTube if there are any other native plant or wildlife or ecosystem topics that interest you, because we would love to continue giving the information that, that people are interested in so that you can successfully plant native plants and of course successfully plant edible native plants. We are the California Native Plant Society dedicated to helping individuals, organizations, and cities plant native plants, the basis of our food web. We offer free lectures and free hikes when it's not a pandemic. We want 
you to get involved with our ecosystem. Our local chapter is the Yerba Buena chapter. It's named after that delicious fog and shade loving herb. And I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for sharing this Saturday afternoon with me. And let's address your questions in the Q&A. Bob, what do we have? Are we able to get... Want me to jump in? You can also click on the Q&A too, Susan, but I can, okay. I can jump in. Have you had success growing miners lettuce during dry season with supplemental water? I have. Uh, there, I have miners lettuce in some pots where I had some perennials, and so I did like a lot of hand watering on that. What it does, um, it doesn't tend to grow in July, but I can start that season earlier in October and run that season later. With the violet flowers being edible, I've wondered that too. I have not seen a specific source telling me that that's so. Um, there are Native American violets in Michigan where the violet flowers are also definitely edible, but I haven't found a source for the California violet flowers being edible. And I, I just haven't decided to take the plunge and find out. And yes, I said that hummingbird sage flowers taste like fruit punch. They are astonishing. It is really fun to find a flower that tastes like that. They are delicious. Um, so Brian, you're asking about cooking the ribe sanguineum. Um, I, I guess I didn't find them bland. I found them that interesting combination of sweet and tart. You can eat them raw. You can certainly cook them. I'm a little bit lazy. Okay, I'm a lot a bit lazy, so I tended to talk about things that can be eaten raw. Um, so boysenberries do well in San Francisco climate. I don't know. Um, uh, boysenberry is, is not a native plant, so I'm only familiar with, with growing the edible native plants because did I mention that I'm lazy? They're easier to grow. So yeah, you're asking about blue elderberry flowers being edible. They are. Um, so they're edible. My understanding is raw and cooked. I haven't eaten them raw because I want those berries. And my understanding is you take them, you can take them and you can batter them and fry them like pancakes. I have not tried that. You do want to be careful with the twigs on a blue elderberry. Um, the, the twigs can cause uh, diarrhea. So just be super, it, it was actually a feature and used as a medicinal tool, but it's another reason I haven't exactly tried that because I'm a little worried about getting any twiggy parts, parts in there. Um, you can't find out if wild blackberries on parkland have been sprayed in San Francisco. Um, I can assure you that the wild blackberries on parkland are that invasive Himalayan blackberry and you are taking your life in your hands if you eat it. Um, there's no way to tell if it's been sprayed or not. And those are very difficult plants to remove. So um, San Francisco Parks Department does have permission to use Roundup on them. So I need to find a way to make this presentation available. Uh, certainly go to our website, the California Native Plant Society, um, cnpscierbabuena.org website, go to the biodiversity resources, and we've got our edible plant handouts there. I'll go ahead and PDF that and, and put it there. This is in Keynote, so I realize not everyone can read that. Um, let's see. Oh, so Huckleberry, it's Vaccinium ovatum Blue Madonna. So when you go to the the nursery to get this plant, say, if, if you happen to forget which one it is, just ask them and say, so I hear there's a huckleberry that's a heavy fruit producer and they'll go, oh, it's the blue Madonna. I have to tell you, it is the only one gallon plant I've ever spent $25 for, completely worth it. That stuff is $16 a pint at Rainbow Groceries. So, and it's delicious and you can eat it right off the, the... oh, violets are taking over your yard. Um, I don't know which violet you have. I haven't found them invasive. They, they the native violets tend to make something that's about a, a circle that's about a dinner plate size. So I just haven't found them invasive. They're 
in a part of my garden that's not in a seep. I, I'm very lucky to have a seep. So they do dry out and, and die back. Um, so it would be interesting to know which ones you have. Monterey, Monterey's got a lot of the same edible plants that we do. Uh, you're gonna want to watch the ones that need a lot of water. So um, just, just be careful if you've got a, a dry area, don't, don't plant the water loving plants. Um, let's see. Uh, so I only grow one kind of onion so far. I keep meaning to buy more onion bulbs and I'm growing one of the white flowered ones that was given to me as a gift. So I'm not exactly sure which California onion it is, but all of the California onion seeds taste slightly oniony. So get any of those 70 species. Our, our species in San Francisco are that Allium unifolium, the one leaf onion or the coast onion. So I would go with, uh, with those because they're pink and they're gorgeous. They're, they're super yummy on avocado toast. Oh, that's interesting that your beach strawberry hasn't fruited. Um, all of the strawberries I've seen fruit, Bob may know more about that than I do because I'm on clay. I grow the woodland strawberry, the Fregaria vesca. I, I, can't, I can't grow the beach strawberry. Um, let's see. So my understanding, I water plants with some gray water as well. My understanding is that the, slope, the, the soap doesn't get into the fruits and vegetables. It's what plants do well is they clean water with their root system before it goes up. So I haven't had a problem with that. Um, it, yeah, you should, you should be able to continue watering your plants with laundry water. I also use um, cool cooking water as long as it didn't have salt in it. So no pasta water but any, and no soda, nothing with salt, but anything else. So recipes, so again, if you want tomatoes, you, you, want to, you want to read Golden Gate Gardening by Pam Pierce. I'm only doing the, the native edible plants. I, I don't do the, the other ones. Recipes for using native plants. I do a lot of substitutions um, where I'm using the native mint for in, in a recipe that calls for mint or I'm using the native currants in a recipe that calls for currants, or I'm using the huckleberries where in a recipe that calls for blueberries. There is an Oregon website called Bosque Dell Natives, and they've got a web, they've got a, an, a, a recipe section, so which is really nice. Um, let's see. So, so for South Bay and the peninsula and Monterey. The search term is ethnobotany. Go find out what your native tribes are. Look in the ethnobotany, Daniel Mormon's Native American Ethnobotany book. Look up the tribe, tribe look up the food. And so it's, it's a multi-step process, but completely worth it. You know your tribe, you, you can look them up in the Daniel Mormon Native American Ethnobotany list and there will be a list of what they used for food. There will be a list of what they used for medicine and for tools. So for what it's worth, Monterey South Bay Peninsula, it's many of the same plants, just be careful with the soil. Also, you, you guys have a lot of other sages that we don't have. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun, especially all the, the sage tasting. So with miner's lettuce, I haven't, I haven't noticed anything um, that reminds me that it's got oxalic acid. Uh, if it does, it doesn't have very much. I've tasted the oxalic, oxalic acid in oxalis because it's invasive and I don't taste that same level of, of sort of sharp and, and tart. The book for non-natives is Pam Pierce's Golden Gate Gardening. The library's got a bunch of copies. It's, it's a wonderful book, but it is all non-native edibles. I have not found, it, found that miner's lettuce planted on the ground is invasive, um, but it could be because I eat a lot of it. So, 
Um, and I like when it turns into a, a winter ground cover. So, and um, we've got a small garden with some hardscape, so it keeps it contained. So I haven't found it to be invasive, but your, your mileage might vary. Uh, there is no part of a ceanothus that's edible, unfortunately. Oh, okay, that's not entirely true. I have read that the leaves are edible. They don't taste delicious to me, so that's why I didn't. It, the ceanothus will be in the pollinator presentation, and I realize I'm showing you a picture of a ceanothus here. It's not actually edible. Those flowers were used as um, soap for hair washing, so yeah, don't, don't eat that. Uh, and you can, you can check to see if you like the taste of the, the cenothus leaves. I just don't happen to. Mahonia aquifolium, um, Mahonia, the, the Berberis aquifolium. Yes, um, it's native, but not to San Francisco. It's native to the, uh, the northern part, so Humboldt County. Um, you can look on the Calscape site and click on a, a particular name of a plant and figure out where it's native to. Yes, it's got, so all of the Berberis, all of the native Berberis or Mahonias have edible, um, edible fruit. They're all on that tart side. They all have pectin. Uh, so they're all good in pies. I would use it where you would use rhubarb in a pie because rhubarb doesn't necessarily grow here. And you've got a nice um, tart, firm thing that you can then drench with maple syrup in pie. Mm, maple syrup. So what is next? Um, so are onions, viola, and claytonia, do they well do well to reseed and naturalized? So uh, claytonia, that miner's lettuce is the easiest. It's the easiest thing you can grow. And yes, it will produce seed. And yes, it will get a bigger patch. It will eventually spread everywhere, but it doesn't seem to interfere with anything else growing. Um, so I, I haven't had, had trouble with that. Um, where did that go? And you asked, oh, how do you protect Brodiaea from squirrels and rodents? I haven't, I don't have that problem. Um, We've got a courtyard garden and so squirrels and rodents can't get in. But I, I hear from friends that they're using those wire mesh cages, which is kind of a problem. Um, not a problem to use mesh cages, just a problem that you have to use it. Let's see. And oregano and thyme. So when I talk about herbs, uh, really that's that yerba buena is that native herb or the monkey flower savory or any of our sages. Those are our native herbs that I recommend. Um, thyme and oregano with that yerba buena being the closest thing we have to, ore to oregano. To me, it doesn't have a very strong minty flavor. The monkey flower savory has an extremely minty flavor. And the sages are close enough to French sage that I can use them when I'm cooking. The nice thing about yerba buena is that if you have a shady garden, it's a wonderful herb. The same thing with the monkey flower savory. They're both great in shady gardens, as opposed to the sages, or at least almost all the sages need their own, need sun. Uh, again, the hummingbird sage can take quite a bit of, sh say of, of shade. It has very large leaves, much larger than most sage plants. So you would only need to take a little bit of it because sage is such a strong, strongly flavored um, thing. So let's see. So native plants to attract hummingbirds. I do. So we're going to be talking about native plants for humming for pollinators, butterflies and pollinators. So that's going to include hummingbirds and bees on August 22nd. I will say that hummingbirds sage they love. Those ribes, those currants, they love those, especially because they're blooming in the winter and the early spring when not a lot of other things bloom. So um, those currants are fabulous. They're pretty, the hummingbirds love them. They're an important winter food source. Um, we can eat the berries. That pink flowering currant grows in both uh, clay and sandy soil. So it's a great plant to grow for hummingbirds but I will address additional hummingbird plants that aren't edible for people 
on the August 22nd presentation. Um, basil and mint. So, so I strongly recommend, again, I'm a native plant person, so I have my own uh, approach to this, but I strongly recommend that if you want to grow mint, you grow monkey flower savory. If you want a strong mint and you grow um, yerba buena, if you want a milder mint, those are easy to grow in San Francisco. Basil and uh, European mint, go, go, <laughs> go look in Pam Pierce's book. So yerba buena does not spread the way mint does. Uh, it's, a, it's relatively slow growing. It seems to, to just like to live in a patch that gets quite a bit of, of shade. It's nearby some area that gets sun and it just doesn't tend to grow into that. It realizes there's sun there and it stops. Hummingbird sage is not the same as pineapple sage. Um, I will admit that pineapple sage, salvia elegans, okay. I'll admit it, it's a non-native sage. It's beautiful, it's from Mexico. It blooms for six months. It's bulletproof drought tolerant um, and it blooms from October to March. So it's another great winter plant. The leaves taste like, like pineapple. And so you can use those in tea or you can use those in salad. It's, it's delicious and the hummingbirds do love it. And it's not the same as pineapple sage, grow them both. Are there any native plants that deter gophers? Um, not that I know. And the size for monkey flower sage, it's, it's not very big. Um, it's about a foot by not quite a foot. You'll be able to get the precise size from the CalScape website. They'll be able to give you all of that information. Susan, I have one question from YouTube. And sure. that is my native irises that are all drying up and dying this year. They are not edible that I know of. And my problem may be not for general interest, but I need help. So this was a terrible rain year. We got nine inches of rain and our plants expect approximately 20. Um, because of the variety of rain that I've seen over the last few years, the native plants here seem to do okay with a minimum of 14 inches of rain. Back when we got 11 and 12 inches of rain, everything was very, very cranky. So your native iris, which are not edible, do not eat those. Those are poisonous. All iris are poisonous, not just ours. European iris are poisonous, Asian iris are poisonous. Don't eat those plants, they'll make you sick. So where were we? Um, so my leaves are drying up too. You've got a couple of choices. Uh, they, they can go dormant in the summer and then uh, reanimate in the fall when there's water. You can also give them some additional summer water from cooking water that doesn't have salt or laundry water, any, any water that you've got left over from something else. Uh, they'll, they'll do all right with them. Do give them a little bit of summer drought. They, they do expect it. But yeah, I'm sorry about those brown leaves. It's, it was a really hard rain year. My, my garden is really unhappy. More questions? That's all I have from YouTube. Okay, have we answered everything from? You answered everything. <laughs> really? wow. And there was a lot of like, thank yous and this was a great presentation and all of those feel goods. Wonderful. So, for those of you who are interested in planting for hummingbirds and butterflies and bees, I'm hoping to see you on August 22nd. And for those of you who are planting in shade and shade and wind, I'm hoping to see you all on September 26th. Absolutely, that was great. And I will send out that follow-up email. You can also check the sfpl.org for all of those events, register for this Great interaction you get here in the webinar, or you can check it live on YouTube. Susan, Bob, thank you so much for being here. What a great success. And everybody who's still here, thank you for virtual summer uh, learning. And don't forget to sign up for Summer Stride, summerstride.org, sfpl.org slash summerstride. All right, this is where it gets weird. We're out, folks. Thank you. Bye, Susan. Bye, Bob. Bye.